Hello and welcome to our webcast at the Therapeutic Crossroads for Renal Cell Cancer, investigating the current application, controversies, and the future use of immunotherapy and targeted agents. Tonight, we will explore the latest update in the therapeutic options for advanced kidney cancer and have case discussions to explore strategies for choosing the optimal and effective treatment plans for our patients. I'm Dr. Tony Schwery from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, and I'm pleased to welcome my colleagues, Dr. David McDermott from the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, also in Boston, and Dr. Nizar Tanir from the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. Before we move on, I would like to thank the Medical Learning Institute, the Kidney Cancer Research Alliance, and PVI for developing this educational event and thank Bristol Myers Squibb, Calitera Biosciences, and Excel Access for providing the educational grants for this web broadcast. Look out for polling questions we'll be posing during the session, and please, please submit your question for all of us by entering them in the space provided. These are my disclosures, and these are the faculty disclosures with me today, Dr. McDermott and Dr. Kenneer. These are some disclosure of unlabeled use, as well as the disclaimer during this program. Please visit us at this link to watch for the on-demand version in the coming weeks, to download the slides and the practice aid and apply for CME and mock credit. And please join the conversation on Twitter at PeerView. This is tonight's agenda. We're going to discuss the current and last up-to-date state of immune and target treatment option in advanced RCC. We have some cases from every day's clinic to consider for treatment selection. We're gonna talk not just about frontline, but about later line therapies. And then at the end, we're gonna offer some insight into the novel modalities that we have on the horizon and the next studies and targets in renal cell cancer. So let me start here. In advanced RCC, we should know our risk. We should know the risk of the patient in front of us. And for that, there are several risk models. Most importantly here highlighted is the IMDC, the International Metastatic Database Consortium uh, risk model that involve six readily available clinical and lab parameters, as you can see. And that captures, to a large extent, the natural history of metastatic RCC patients and divide the patient into favorable, intermediate, and poor risk. And these models are proving to be relevant, not just in the targeted therapy era, but also in the more recent era of immunotherapy, uh, as well as combined uh, immunotherapy and checkpoint and TKIs. What do we have today? What do we have today in terms of approved first-line combination therapies? In terms of classes, we have to think about first-line therapy in terms of PD-1 and PDL1 inhibitors, in terms of TKI, and in terms of CTLA4 inhibitors. So for poor and intermediate risk, based on Checkmate 214, and Dr. Tanir gonna go through this, we have the combination of ipilimumab, nivolumab. We all call it ipinevo. Then in all risk group, um, two combination approved as of today, the combination of pembrolizumab, axitinib, pembroaxi, based on Keynote 426, and a third combination of avilumab, axitinib, avilumab, axi, based on the Javelin Renal 101. If we look at standard of care for advanced RCC for first-line therapy, and we look today at the NCCN guideline, again, the risk group come, and patients are divided into favorable, which is around 20%, 20, 25% of all patients, and poor and intermediate. And you can say, see here the preferred regimen mostly based on the study being phase three and based on the benefit. For example, favorable pa patient uh, with acetinib pembro 
or pazapanib or sunitinib, an intermediate and poor patient, nevo ipi is category one, axipembro, all based on an overall survival benefit. Cabozentinib is there, uh, but it's not category one because of the randomized phase two of cabosan. There are other recommended regimen here um, uh, based on the trial. And then there are some regimen that are useful under certain circumstances. So let's move to look at innovative immune and targeted options. And for that, I'm going to transition to Dr. Tanir. Dr. Tanir, please take us here through the immunotherapy option. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Shwery. And um, it's a pleasure to be with you uh, and share with you the latest data from the Checkmate 214 study. Uh, which is a large phase three trial uh, in 1,096 patients uh, with advanced clear cell RCC. This is the study's design. Uh, the key eligibility criteria are here, treatment naive, uh, advanced clear cell RCC uh, with Karnofsky score 70% or better. There were two strata, IMDC risk, as Tony mentioned, and region. And the patients were randomized one-to-one uh, -one to receive nevo ipi at the standard dose and schedules here, shown here in this box, or sunitinib as the control arm at the standard dose and schedule. The co-primary endpoints were in the patient population with intermediate risk and poor risk, and these were PFS, OS, and ORR. The secondary endpoints were PFS, OS, and ORR in the intent-to-treat population. That's all patients enrolled on the trial, and there were exploratory endpoints with PFS, OS, and ORR in the cohort with favorable risk. And here is a summary of the uh, median OS and PFS at different time points in this table. This, these time points are minimum follow-up. The first analysis, the primary analysis, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2018, then subsequently this analysis at 30 months minimum follow-up, and then recently 42 months minimum follow-up, which was published in JITSI. And here, as you can see, for patients with intermediate risk, poor risk, treated with nevo -epi, the median OS was not reached versus 26 months median with sunitinib at the initial analysis. And you see the hazard ratio 0 0.63 for OS and the tight, narrow confidence intervals so this was a significant difference. And then just to uh, take you to the latest here at 42 months, which was published, median OS with nevo AP for intermediate risk or risk now was 47 months versus 26 months. Again, to just show you over time, the median OS for page treated with sunitinib has not changed. And now it's about four month, four years median OS with nevo AP for that intermediate risk uh, intermediate risk and poor risk population. Looking at the PFS here, the median was 11.6 in the early analysis versus 8.4 months with sunitinib. And as you go down the, the line, the, the, the numbers have not changed. Just important to mention that for the 30-month minimum follow-up, the assessment for PFS and ORR was done by investigators, whereas at the initial analysis and the more recent analysis, the assessment was done by independent radiology review. Now let's look at the latest data which was presented at ESMO this last weekend. And here is the kaplan meier curves plot for OS with a minimum follow-up of 48 months for, again, the primary patient population of intermediate risk or risk. And you can see here now the median OS for nevo epi treated patients with intermediate risk or risk is 48 months and for sunitinib, 26 months. The hazard ratio for that difference in OS between the two groups is 0 0.65 with a narrow intervals, and this was a statistically significant difference. Now next, we'll look at the kaplan marker plot for PFS. Again, uh, the latest from ESMO with 48 months minimum follow-up for that primary population of intermediate risk. The median is 11.2 months for nevo epi 
versus 8.3 months for sinitinib. This difference has a hazard ratio of 0.74. And you can see here, there is a, an apparent a trend at the plateau or tail at the end of the curve for the nevo epi treated patients. But we'll see over time now with longer follow-up how where the, that tail at the end of the curve will settle. Now looking here at the responses, and again, uh, looking at the here the, in the first column, the primary patient population of intermediate risk poor risk, then in the middle column, the intent to treat all patients enrolled under trial, and then the exploratory group with favorable risk. I think it's important to note that the uh, response rate for the intermediate risk and poor risk was 42% with nevo epi versus 27% with sinitinib. And this data is basically hasn't changed much from the initial analysis, which was uh, in uh, 2017. And the data has, has for the intermediate, uh, for the inter, uh, intent to treat patient population, the response rate is 39% with nevo epi for uh, the intent to treat versus 32% uh, uh, for uh, sunitinib. Looking at now favorable risk, this was an exploratory 249, 249 patients with 125 patients randomized to nevo epi with favorable risk versus 124 uh, randomized to sunitinib. The results are uh, in favor of sunitinib with 52% of patients achieving a response with sunitinib versus 30% achieving response with nevo epi. However, when you look down at the CR rate, and here is the uh, CR for intermediate risk, poor risk, the intent to treat, and favorable risk. You could see that the CR rate here is above 10%, regardless of the risk category. And if you look again here at the ongoing responses, despite the fact that uh, patients with favorable risk had a better outcome or superior uh, response rate and longer PFS with sinitinib, yet the patients uh, treated with new epi, there were more, a higher percentage of patients with our ongoing responses with nevo epi. Now looking at patients who achieved those uh, CRs of 10 plus, 10, 12% CRs, looking at those patients with complete response and looking at the, what we refer to as the swimmer's uh, plot for those patients. So there were uh, 43 patients uh, treated with uh, nevo epi who achieved a complete response uh, with nevo epi. And there are three distinct groups here. Those who achieved a uh, complete response but are still on therapy, those were 18 patients. And this cohort here of patients who achieved a response and did not receive any further therapy other than nevo epi. So they were off treatment and still in CR. And then there is the group that uh, achieved uh, uh, a complete response, but subsequently received uh, subsequent systemic therapy. So 19 patients out of the 43. So 44% of patients who achieved complete response did not require any further therapy other than nevo epi and maintenance nevo in those patients. And here is basically the same data. 16 patients achieved uh, CR. Uh, with nevo epi who um, um, had favorable risk. And again, here there is a cohort of patients, nine of those 16, uh, who achieved CR and never required any further therapy other than uh, treatment uh, on trial. Now, what about treatment-related adverse events? This bar graph shows you, over time, the percent of patients who had uh, either grade one or two and this is presented in the uh, light blue for nevo epi, or dark blue is the grade three and four, and in light uh, orange or dark orange patients with uh, treated with sinitinib. As you can see here, the first six months are the, uh, this is the time period where the uh, most of the AEs occurred. So over time for both treatment arms, the uh, events are decreased over time. The new events are decreased over time. Now, it's important to remember that in the Checkmate 214, 22% of patients discontinued nevo epi because of toxicity. And it is also important to note that 35% of those patients who, who developed immune-related toxicity secondary to nevo epi 
required uh, corticosteroids uh, for equivalent to 40 milligrams per day of prednisone, but only 10% required to take the high-dose corticosteroids over a month period. So the question uh, people ask, what would be the outcome? What was the outcome of patients who discontinued NevoAP because of toxicity? And some of them, as I just mentioned, required corticosteroids. Well, here is an analysis, subgroup analysis from Checkmate 214 that we published in the Journal of Immunotherapy for Cancer, where we looked at the uh, patients, the cohort who discontinued therapy because of toxicity, and patients who did not discontinue therapy because of toxicity. And you see here the Kaplan markers for OS for these two uh, groups. On top are patients who discontinued, discontinued therapy because of toxicity. And in the blue line, the curve is for patients who did not uh, discontinue therapy because of treatment-related uh, adverse events. And you can see that, you can say that patients who discontinued therapy with NevoAP because of toxicity, their survival was not uh, jeopardized, was not compromised as a result of stopping therapy. So I think that's an, an important point to keep in mind uh, with uh, as a take-home message from the Checkmate 214. Um, uh, data. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tanir. Uh, this, is, this is wonderful. Thank you for guiding us through this. And for that, I'm going to switch to hearing the latest about that because we have a lot of update this year with um, no one else than my close colleague, Dr. McDermott. David, can you guide us through some of these recent results, please? Sure, Tony. It's great to be here with you and Dr. Tanier um, and talk about um, where we are with the combination of the old first-line therapy, which is VEGF blockade, and the um, second-line approach, the old second-line therapy, which is PD-1 blockade. So w when we think about VEGF blockade and PD-1 blockade, there are several advantages to this approach you're essentially targeting the two of the driving biologies of this disease, VEGF overexpression, which leads to angiogenesis, and uh, PD-L1 expression, which leads to immune evasion. So by combining PD-1 and VEGF blockade, you're targeting both of those uh, mechanisms that drive the tumor. And that probably is leading to the improved outcomes that we see with patients by bringing PD-1 up into the front line. You're preventing the death of the patients who have very aggressive tumors that are driven by a PD-L1 expression often. Um, and then you are seeing some synergy between these two approaches by combining VEGF and PD-1 blockade. The most impressive data so far in this combination approach comes from the Keynote 426 study, which looked at pembrolizumab and exitinib versus the old standard of care, sunitinib. You see here the eligibility criteria and stratification. All IMDC risk groups were involved um, in uh, equal amounts. Um, and looking at the combination of PD-1 VEGF versus sunitinib. At the first interim analysis, the results were ridiculously good with a hazard ratio of 0.53 for overall survival, 0.69 for progression-free survival, and a, a overall response rate of close to 60%. Over time, those results have held up. This is a look at overall response in an update that was presented at ASCO by Betsy Plimick. Um, looking at the uh, difference between those survival curves still favoring uh, the combination of Pembroaxi with a minimum follow-up of 23 months. Also progression-free survival uh, still uh, in favor of the combination. Many of the benefits that you see with molecularly targeted therapy approaches like VEGF blockade happen early in the course of disease, so it's not surprising you see um, encouraging improvements in medium progression-free survival, and these still seem to be maintained um, out at two years. And as I mentioned before, responses are often, um, you know, very high with these combination regimens, uh, close to 60% with many of them. And you're also seeing uh, complete responses as well, which suggests there's some synergy, meaning in some patients, VEGF blockade is probably enhancing the res immune response to the tumor, and hopefully that will lead to uh, long-term durable responses, potentially even after treatment stopped. Um, but we've yet to prove that with the VEGF PD-1 approach. You see many of the responses here now durable at um, a median of two years. 
Another a trial which had many similarities with the Keno 426 study is the Javelin Renal 101 study, looking at, in this case, Exitinib again, but this time with a PDL1 antibody, Avelumab versus the old standard of care, Sunitinib. One important difference here um, with that other study is the co primary endpoints, once again, were PFS and overall survival, but in the PDL1 positive uh, set of patients. And not surprisingly, looking at uh, PFS, once again, a clear win for the combination of Avelumab and Exitinib over Sinitinib. However, um, so far, we have not seen a clear um, overall survival advantage, although those data are immature. So we look forward to seeing that in future updates. Uh, and again, um, the VEGF addition to PD-1 is driving very high response rates 56% overall, with almost 6% uh, complete responses. Um, many of those are durable. Most recently, Dr. Shuari presented at the ESMO meeting um, the results of the Checkmate 9ER study. Uh, this study had a very similar design to the last two, looking at the uh, PD-1 antibody nivolumab with the VEGF, CMET, Axel inhibitor, uh, cabozantinib in patients with advanced RCC, once again, all IMDC risk groups here, um, and the primary endpoint was progression-free survival in, in the intent-to-treat uh, population. Um, interestingly, while nivolumab was given every two weeks at the standard dose, the cabozantinib dose was reduced um, from the full dose of 60 milligrams to 40 milligrams daily um, in all patients to start. And once again, a very impressive progression-free survival curve here, um, looking at uh, NEVO and CABO clearly beating almost uh, doubling uh, PFS, excellent hazard ratio of 0 0.51 um, over sunitinib, and overall survival also favoring the combination with a hazard ratio of 0 uh, 0.6. Finally, high response rates, 56%, with the combination 8% complete responses. Once again, this data is uh, somewhat immature, so we look forward to uh, more data on uh, durable overall survival and duration of response, but the early data looks very encouraging for both of those endpoints. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. McDermott and um, Dr. Tanir. So le let me summarize, um, you know, both approaches, IO, IO, and IO VEGF, like we, we say, and uh, mention the clinical take-home um, messages here. So what can you achieve frontline dual checkpoint blockade versus checkpoint inhibitor and TKI? What are the pro and what are the cons? With dual checkpoint blockade, some of the pros are improved overall survival. We do have with nevo Ipi really a mature follow-up data the responses tend to be very durable, and there's a potential to stop therapy. And let's not forget, yes, it's IO, IO, but after three months, we're done with ipilimumab and transferred to nivolumab maintenance. And even in these patients that uh, had treatment-related adverse event, we didn't see a difference in outcome um, in terms of survival. Um, some of the cons is there is no doubt there's a higher immune-related adverse event and compared to TKI plus checkpoint inhibitor, there's a lower uh, PFS uh, response rate, and I would say higher uh, chance of having PD, progressive disease, as best response. On the other hand, with checkpoint T uh, and TKI, we're seeing uh, with pembroaxin improved the overall survival, same as with Cabonivo now, higher response rate, uh, longer PFS, no doubt, compared to the dual checkpoint blockade with lower immune-related adverse event as we are using one uh, checkpoint blocker. In terms of cons, what I see is um, in an imperfect, uh, you know, word of uh, AE attribution, I think this comes up and uh, it is somewhat unclear sometimes how to attribute uh, the side effects and the toxicity. Think about diarrhea that could happen with exitinib, could happen with cabozentinib, uh, but also could happen with immune checkpoint blockers. We all agree that the checkpoint inhibitor and TKI have less mature follow-up. And with two drugs on board and with the TKI on board, 
uh, there will be a chronic TKI toxicity that we don't see with IO, IO, bringing us more into looking at a quality of life and patient reported outcome here. So it's looked like we have some um, questions coming in uh, from the audience. So hopefully the three of us, David, Nizar and myself can answer it. One of the question is, what effect, and I was just touching base on that, what effect on quality of life do the different frontline regimen um, invoke? Um, so um, just as a summary, uh, this was published with IOIO Checkmate 214, knowing there are, you know, difference in uh, the quality of life questionnaire. The combo of nivo AP was shown to be superior to sunitinib in terms of quality of life. Same thing with Checkmate 90R that um, Dr. McDermott presented also in two questionnaires, seems to be superior, statistically significant. We didn't see that with Keynote um, 426. I don't know, maybe I'll ask uh, Nizar here. What, what's your, what, what, how do you look at quality of life here? And what do you think based on uh, what we presented and what was presented? Nizar? Tony, you know, I think, you know, obviously quality of life is important for patients. I mean, obviously, number one goal for any therapy of a patient with cancer, kidney cancer or otherwise, is cure. Patients want to be cured, and we are treating physicians and the researchers want to cure our patients. And that's the, the ultimate goal. That's the number one goal. But I think it's also important to consider that to achieve this goal, um, even if we don't achieve it uh, except for a small percentage of patients, prolongation of survival and having a good quality of life is important. So I think when you look at, for example, uh, nivo EP, I think uh, as I showed the bar graph for the treatment rate adverse events over time, most of the uh, uh, adverse events occur early on, the first six months. So I think if a patient is able to go through the induction period with nivo EP during the first 12 weeks when they are receiving the uh, dual agents uh, every three weeks uh, during the first 12 weeks, if they're able to go through the, those for 12 weeks, um, and this actually happened during uh, when we uh, conducted the Checkmate 214 Phase 3 trial, and in real world, in, in practice, uh, if we, our goal is to get our patients through the first 12 weeks. If they get through the 12 weeks and they do not develop any immune-related adverse events, then they go on, it's like going through a, uh, uh, an easier period with maintenance with, uh, with nivolumab every four weeks. Um, I think there are still some adverse events that could affect quality of life. Uh, patients can develop uh, some of these immune related adverse events. Uh, we haven't spoken much about in the, uh, because of time constraints, but they can develop rashes, arthritis. They can develop immune related uh, endocrine deficiencies, which obviously can affect quality of life. But the reason the patients with uh, on Checkmate 214 uh, treated with nivo AP had a better quality of life is because the vast majority of these patients, as we saw, had intermediate risk school risk. So they were symptomatic. A good number of those patients were symptomatic from their cancer. So the goal of care, the goal of treatment is to obviously prolong survival when we can and cure when we can. We aspire for that, but we really want to also uh, uh, make those symptoms that the patient is suffering from as a result of their advanced cancer go away or lessen. And I think this is where nivo uh, and I would say that also uh, the uh, TKS-IO, the goal there is also to reduce the burden of disease. And by reducing the burden of the disease, uh, even if you do not achieve CR, hopefully the patient's symptoms from the cancer will be lessened. And I think this is a... a, a so, so these are, uh, you do have, so to you, quality of life and patient reported outcome are important component when, when you know, when the cure is only in a small um, potential, a small, small uh, uh, group of patients. Maybe David, directly, the quality of life and the PRO between the three studies, 426, 214, and 90R. Okay, so comparing across studies is sort of fraught, and you know I don't think we should do it if we can avoid it. Um, I, so I, I don't know that we know that the methodologic differences between the analysis explain the results. 
I think one thing that might explain some of the you know positive quality of life results in some of the individual studies is the way the regimens are given. He's already mentioned this. Um, in Checkmate 214, Nevo Ipi, you're holding the Ipi after three months. So if you avoid a serious IO toxicity, um, you're just getting single agent PD-1. That's probably the easiest regimen of these combos to get is just single agent PD-1. You're avoiding VEGF, you're avoiding CTLA-4. Um, it's hard to beat that from a quality of life uh, perspective as opposed to chronic therapy. And 9ER, you're starting at a lower dose of Cabo, and you're also in some patients reducing the dose. That probably has some positive impacts on quality of life uh, compared to, say, full dose of Cabo. But the, this sort of drives home a second point, which is stopping the drug or stopping both drugs is ideal for quality of life. Um, and we know you can stop um, Nevo Ipi in some patients. Nizar showed that data with treatment free intervals. We've looked at treatment free survival. You know, that should be our goal is creating those deep responders from which you can often stop therapy, giving patients breaks from treatment, creating remissions. That is, has a major impact on quality of life and length of life. I think it remains to be seen whether VEGF PD1 combinations can produce as many treatment free intervals as we've seen with CTLA4 PD1, but I hope so. Um, and those investigators should show us that data, and we should be encouraging, I think in general, future studies to explore stopping therapy in our deep responders. Those who have 80, 90, 100% shrinkages of their tumor, maybe we can stop those patients, give them a break, and improve not only quality of life, uh, but cost and length of life. Very good. Okay. Um, let, let, us, let us look at a few cases now and focus how we might work with patient to talk through treatment options and perhaps manage uh, safety consideration where on different um, treatment, when patient of different treatment. So this is Mr. Jones, a newly diagnosed advanced RCC, uh, has several metastatic sites, uh, including liver metastases. Overall, looking at the IMDC risk group, this patient, this patient has a poor risk um, IMDC poor risk, uh, hemoglobin less than the lower limit of normal, the neutrophil count, the absolute neutrophil count are more than the upper limit of normal. The KPS is 70%. And of course, this patient presented with metastatic disease, so at least uh, four. So let me ask you maybe, uh, Dr. Uh, Tanir, is this is an ideal uh, candidate for dual checkpoint inhibitor? Yes, Tony, I think this would be the ideal candidate for uh, Nevo Ipi. And uh, I've had several of those patients enrolled on Checkme 214 who had a good outcome and who had actually achieved a CR with uh, during the induction. So we didn't do scans till after they finished all four cycles of induction with Nevo Ipi. So when, they, um, when we did the scans at 12 weeks, they had uh, uh, some of these patients uh, CR. And um, I think uh, in private, uh, in the real world, in, the, in, uh, uh, in practices, when we treat patients off protocol, these are patients who would be uh, also candidates to receive this therapy. Not to say that uh, a uh, TKI plus a PD-1 antibody, um, such as pembrolizumab plus axitinib, or uh, as you showed at Esmotoni, uh, nivolumab plus cabozantinib, would not be also alternative choices. I think these are alternative choices. My, uh, uh, when I look at patients with say intermediate risk, poor risk, this patient obviously has poor risk. Uh, the, the important thing uh, one has to take into consideration is what is the uh, life expectancy of the patient? If I feel like the patient is able to go through 12 weeks of therapy uh, or at least three cycles of say Nevo Ipi, and I believe if when we do scans, if that patient did not respond, I still have chance to treat that patient with a second line therapy. Nevo Ip is my first choice uh, because then that opens to me all the options for subsequent therapies uh, with TKIs and other options rather than treating them up front with a TKI. Yeah, plus are, one, one thing that comes up all the time is the rate of PD as best response with Nevo Ipi when you don't have VEGF inhibition is 20%. Are you worried that this patient may blow through therapy and wouldn't have a chance 
to control their disease. So this is exactly what I said, Tony. I, I think what I, exactly what I said uh, is uh, I do take that into consideration. So obviously I am, what I want to do is give the therapy that would give them the CR that's durable and the tail at the end of the curve, which is what I think is most important for our therapies, is the tail at the end of the curve. Can we cure those patients or at least produce CRs that are durable? But the other important uh, uh, consideration is, do I think the patient has a chance if they progress through uh, the first line therapy with nevo -Ipi, Can I still get them to a second line? If I feel, and it's, it's this is not science, it's obviously I wish we had predictive biomarkers to know a priori before we start therapy, this patient is going to respond or not going to respond to therapy. And then of course we can tailor the therapy to the, to those patients. But if it's, it's, that's where the science clinic, the, the art of medicine, art of oncology. If I, I believe the patient has a chance to get to a second line, I would treat this patient. I have treated several of those with Nevo EP up front. And if they didn't respond, I had a chance to go treat them with a, a TKI such as Cabozantinib for a patient like this, for example, in the second line setting. Let me let me move, sorry, just for time to David. You know, in terms of immune, let's say this patient start on nivolumab and ipilimumab. I assume, David, with your vast experience, you've seen at least um, perhaps, unfortunately, one of these immune-related um, adverse event. Um, can you expand on that? Sure. So when you're applying immune checkpoint blockade in any t cancer, including kidney cancer, as far as side effects goes, pretty much anything that ends with an itis can happen. Um, any organ in the body can be affected, can be inflamed by an immune attack on the, on the uh, organ and lead to complications. Now, the good news is most of those, if detected early, can be treated and reversed with immune suppression, and patients with side effects don't appear to be do, do worse. That said, you need to know about the side effects to treat them, so that you need to really educate, in some ways over-educate your patients to call, um, because if they delay calling for new symptoms, like a new skin rash or new diarrhea or worsening fatigue, that can often translate into a, a, a bad outcome where they need to be admitted for say IV immunosuppression or they end up in intensive care. But if they call you early, you can um, intervene and reverse these side effects uh, quickly without making it more likely that the cancer will grow. So er education, early intervention are key. There's some of these on this list that are more common than others. So for example, diarrhea, skin rash, are, you know, are pretty common. Some are fortunately rare. Some are more reversible than others. But education, early intervention are the key to managing these um, and uh, safely um, and effectively. Great. Great. Thank you, David. Let's move to Mr. Smith, a 52-year-old man with present with stage 3 disease. And uh, this patient had a radical nephrectomy, underwent regular surveillance imaging, and at 18 months, this patient had two um, enlarging uh, lung nodule and classified overall as a favorable risk for the IMDC risk criteria. David, back to you. Um, how would you, let's say, uh, given the recent data, what would you do here? Well, if you're going by the um, NCCN criteria, you know, PD-1, um, certainly makes sense. And the favored combination based on the data would be a VEGF PD-1 combination with so far the strongest data because you have both PFS and OS with either Nevo Cabo or Axi Pembro. They're very comparable data sets in, in my opinion. So offering that to a patient um, is certainly uh, the standard. Um, there are those who would off also offer Nevo Ipi in this uh, setting, and you know I believe it's a, a therapy that's considered in the NCCN guidelines, but not most favored. You can make an argument that that makes sense um, as well. Um, you know, overall survival here uh, seems to be the same when you compare Nevo Ipi and favorable risk to sunitinib, but the time that patients spend off treatment, the number of CRs is higher in this. Um, subgroup, so that could also be considered. But I think VEGF PD-1 is the way to go for Mr. Smith. I, I agree. I mean, this is, and we talked about uh, toxicities, um, you know, also with IO 
TKI, uh, where we withhold TKI, continue I.O. components sometimes. You know, I think important to, and, and we forget to do that, to um, support uh, and give appropriate supportive uh, care. And um, one of the thing is if the AE does not resolve with TKI cessation thinking about someone, let's say you started on VEGF IO and we um, suspect an immune related uh, adverse event, the manage the toxicity first as fast as we can and using the uh, current immune related adverse event management uh, guidelines. And really this touch break based on what David was saying how to encourage patients to report adverse event early. This is a beautiful study where they surveyed over 1,100 patients with advanced RCC. And uh, a lot of responders actually reported they often waited until their next appointment to report adverse events. So, so David, you know, your practice, you know, in line with actually when we, when we talk to the patient, not just when you feel that the patient, you know, wait, but actually this is coming from the patient. This is almost, uh, you know, a patient reported uh, uh, outcome, but look at the green, 28% of patients wait until the next appointment. And if you add to the patient that maybe do not want to, you know, upset their provider or, you know, never. So you have 38% more than one third of uh, patients uh, either waiting to the next appointment or never calling, and only one third of patients, you know, immediately calling. So I think we have to do overall a better job um, for, uh, you know, education. Uh, now, maybe uh, back to Nizar a bit. Let's say Mr. Jones or Smith, both of them develop, unfortunately, progressive disease. Uh, in RCC. This is the latest in terms of NCCN uh, option for second line therapy. Um, you know, think about it. This is in terms of second line mostly rather than specific for IO. Cabozentinib based on Meteor is category one OS benefit. Nivalumab based on uh, Checkmate O25 is category one. And we've seen Nivalumab and Ipilimumab, especially post TKI having activity. These are the NCC and other recommended uh, uh, regimen. Um, you know, Accetinib is still there based on the ACCESS trial, although that trial was uh, mostly post-TKI or post-interferon, not post-immune checkpoint blocker. And we do have, you know, other uh, potentially useful um, uh, drugs and combination under certain circumstances, um, drugs, single agent like high dose, um, uh, IL-2. Uh, uh, David, uh, in this situation, whether the patient, let's say, was on nevo ap or a VEGF IO, what is uh, overall your second line uh, therapy? Right. So there is some data, but and we'll go over it, but there's not a lot of prospective data on what to do after patients fail combinations. I think, and Nizar alluded to this earlier, when patients are on IO, IO first, it's you know, reasonable to assume that VEGF blockade will work very well in those patients. So when you're going from Ipinevo to say something like Cabo or Axi, you're probably going to see activity. So switching to VEGF in those patients makes a lot of sense. It's less clear what works after VEGF PD-1 fails, and we need prospective trials in that setting. Considering an alternative VEGF strategy is certainly rational. So if a patient had Exitinib with Pembro going to Cabo makes sense. If someone had Cabo with Nevo up front switching to Axi makes sense. Uh, but we need more trials um, for these patients. Dr. Tanir, you don't have a trial and the patient, uh, let's say, started by Nevo AP or VEGF IO. What's your preferred regimen, second line, um, even without explanation? What jumps to mind? I think uh, first it's important to I would like to make this point and I this is a plea patients who receive an immune checkpoint based therapy in first line and they progress unless there is a clinical trial for them with another uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor they should be they should not be receiving uh, another PD1 antibody in the salvage setting uh, and this is where I think uh, I don't know if we're going to you're going to uh, allude to it, Tony, uh, maybe later on. 
Yes, about the contact three trial. So um, off protocol, I think uh, a TKI, if whatever they did not receive up front, they'll receive it in the salvage setting. So my uh, uh, go-to TKI, if they receive Devo AP up front, is AXI, because I think AXI, unless they have poor risk when they progress after Devo AP, if they don't have poor risk, they don't have bone metastasis, AXI uh, performs very well post-NEVO um, uh, AP. And we published in European Journal of Cancer a retrospective review of in some 70 patients or so from MD Anderson and Memorial, where we showed that AXI and CABO had comparable response rate around 40% with a median PFS more than longer than 10 months. So if they are uh, VGFRTKI naive, I think either AXI or CABO. I like AXI, then CABO, because I think I can salvage some of the AXI progressors uh, with CABO, I am not sure about the other sequence. If I give them CABO in the second line post new AP and they progress, I'm not confident that they will respond to AXI. I will have to go to a LANEV, for example, in that situation. But if they have poor risk with bone metastasis after new AP, then obviously I think CABO will be the best choice. Okay, very good. Um, thank you. So, um, Let's look at the road ahead, surveying potentially the next wave of uh, innovation. I, I wanted to go through, um, you know, phase three trial that assess the immunotherapy combination, starting with COSMIC 313 that will answer a lot of questions because it does use finally a modern control arm. The control arm in this study is nivolumab and ipilimumab, and the experimental arm is the combination of nivolumab, ipilimumab, plus cabozantinib, 40 milligram once a day. This is an ongoing uh, study that is accruing patient, patients as of, um, you know, uh, today. Um, patients are stratified by the IMDC risk score in the region. Progression-free survival by independent central review is the primary endpoint, and OS is a key secondary endpoint. Another study is an alliance study here, um, led by Dr. Zhang and uh, others by the name Pedigree, it's a more sequential type study where a patient with intermediate and poor risk, like with COSME 313, uh, get um, nivolumab and ipilimumab, and then it's a response adaptive uh, design where if they have a CR, they get nivolumab for a year, those 10% of patients. If they have PD, they cross to cabozentinib, a single agent. And for those 70% of patients that have, you know, a partial response or a stable disease, these are the patients normally they get nivolumab. Well, that is the maintenance standard here, or the experimental arm becomes nivolumab or cabozentinib. This study is actively uh, enrolling. Uh, Pivot9 is a study that actually uh, Dr. Trenier is leading here. It's a novel um, drug, epigulated interleukin-2 uh, agonist by the name Nectar-214 in combination with nivolumab <laughs> versus uh, sunitinib or cabozentinib. Also, the study is actually uh, enrolling worldwide. Now, a study that actually finished enrolling is this CLEAR study. It's <coughs> quite an interesting uh, study that... Um, uh, have sunitinib, hopefully the, one of the last studies that have sunitinib as control arm and has two experimental arm. Uh, one is the combination of lymvatinib <coughs> and PD-1 inhibitor pembrolizumab. And another combination actually that doesn't have an immune checkpoint blocker <coughs> is the combination of lymvatinib and everolimus. The primary endpoint is progression-free uh, survival. Uh, so I'm going to transition to Dr. Uh, McDermott since we discussed examples of ongoing approaches for first-line therapy. We touched base on second-line treatment, but what actually happens when uh, PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitor uh, fail our patients and their tumor progress? David? Great. Thanks, Tony. Um, so there there isn't a lot of prospective randomized data in this space, but there is some data. Um, and this was one of the trials that was led from the team at um, Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, Dr. Lee has presented this at several meetings, looking at the VEGF inhibitor lemvatinib with PD-1 blockade and pembrolizumab. 
in a phase two single arm trial looking at patients who had been exposed to either PD-1 or PD-L1 um, and then progressed. Um, and here you see um, very encouraging response rates in that setting with the combination close to uh, 58%. Um, the vast majority of these um, responses were uh, partial responses. The group didn't report any new uh, safety signals, and they're planning a, uh, a phase three trial looking at this, uh, uh, you know, potentially in the future. Um, you know, another study um, that's looked at a novel VEGF inhibitor, uh, tavozinib, um, here, which is a very potent uh, VEGF inhibitor with a very clean uh, toxicity profile. Um, this drug is, FD, is approved for use in Europe, but not yet in the U.S. This was the trial um, of patients who had failed uh, multiple prior regimens. Most of them had failed multiple prior VEGF regimens. They were then stratified based on whether they had received a prior uh, TKI with a checkpoint inhibitor or just uh, TKI and something else, um, comparing head-to-head -head with the old uh, therapy uh, serapinib. A clear win here in both uh, progression uh, in progression free survival, favoring the combination, excuse me, favoring tavozinib with an encouraging tail on the curve here at out at two years, almost 20% of patients progression free. And this is a very uh, VEGF heavily uh, treated uh, patient. So in this, in this trial, these are patients that are not only getting a statistically significant benefit, but probably a clinically meaningful one, um, it's, it's uncommon to see such durability of response in a heavily pretreated um, group of patients. Um, overall survival was uh, comparable in both groups. Um, this was trial was alluded to before, so obviously we need prospective randomized trials in the setting of when patients had both failed VEGF and PD-1 on the tavozinib trial, only a small subset of patients had been exposed uh, to PD-1 blockade. Um, and there, the activity of tavozinib was encouraging. Let's look at this CONTACT-3 trial, which looks at patients who've had prior immune checkpoint treatment and randomizes them to either the current standard of care, uh, one of those standards, uh, cabozantinib, versus the combination of cabo plus the pdl one inhibitor, uh, tezolizumab. So this will give us some uh, prospective data so we can answer the question that Nizar was posing before is, does PD-1 or PD-L1 blockade have any role um, after patients have failed a checkpoint inhibitor? So hopefully this study will give us some of those answers. Also looking at uh, salvage therapy, um, you know, we would like to give single agent PD-1 blockade um, alone, um, if possible, to certain patients because the toxicity profile is so uh, favorable. These, this was two trials that were presented at ASCO this year, Omnivore and the HCRN trial where patients all started on Nevo and based on their response, ipilimumab could be added. Um, we saw encouraging toxicity uh, with this uh, sequential um, approach, um, but some limited um, efficacy. It seemed like um, the uh, you were seeing uh, slightly lower response rates when IPI wasn't added right away and lower CR rates. So um, IPI delayed IPI uh, may not be as potent um, as IPI uh, upfront with nivolumab. Now back to uh, Tony and Dr. Tanir. Yeah, let, let me, what about in totally new drugs and new modalities and, uh, you know, attacking the new pathways, something we always get uh, excited about. So I'm going to uh, give it to Dr. Tanir here to start talking, starting with the glutaminase inhibitors. Nizar. Thank you, Tony, and thank you, David. Uh, uh, as uh, we uh, look at uh, the road ahead of us as uh we mentioned at the outset, what are on the horizon some of the exciting novel agents? And I'd like to review two of those. The first one I'm going to speak about is the uh, glutaminase inhibitor. Uh, this is uh, now has a name of telagnenostat. It was CB839. It's uh, uh, first, I think, to really understand uh, how this drug works. I think it's good to review quickly the metabolism, tumor metabolism. So first, a normal cell will utilize glucose and produce energy in the mitochondria through the TCA cycle uh, through glycolysis. But a cancer cell has an abnormal glucose metabolism because of the uh, Warburg effect. So glucose is, is uh, taken up by the cancer cell, produces lactate. 
and that's not efficient to produce energy for the cell. So what does the cancer cell do? The cancer cell uh, tries to make up, compensate for that abnormal glucose metabolism by increasing glutaminase, by increasing glutamine uh, utilization and glutaminase. So many tumors have increased glutaminase uh, expression in them, and uh, this enzyme converts glutamine to glutamate, and glutamate is taken up in the TCA cycle to produce the energy. In preclinical studies, the combination of this drug, CB839, telaglinosat, which inhibits this glutaminase 1 enzyme uh, that, as I said, blocks the conversion from glutamine to glutamate. So in preclinical studies, the combination of this agent with signal transduction inhibitor, such as Evronimus, inhibited both glucose and glutamine metabolic pathways and produced some synergistic anti-proliferative activity in vitro. And it had enhanced antitumor activity in mouse xenograft models. Based on this preclinical data, the first trial was, in, uh, was uh, launched. And here is the study design of this phase two uh, trial. It started as a 352 patient randomized phase two trial, but then the design was uh, uh, changed to make it a two to one randomization, 69 patient uh, trial, where patients with the key eligibility criteria shown here on the slide. So this is a salvage uh, regimen after at least two prior lines of therapy. And the stratification, as you see here by uh, MSKCC uh, risk and prior TKI one or more than one prior TKI. Patients received the uh, CB839 or telangiostat at 800 milligram twice daily, plus Evrolimus 10 milligram a day, versus placebo plus Evrolimus. So the primary endpoint was PFS by investigator. Again, this is a two-to-one randomization, and the results are shown here. They were presented uh, at ESMO 2019. So this is a couple markers plot for PFS for uh, the two arms, and you see in yellow, uh, the, is the placebo plus erolimus, the control arm, the, the curve on top is the, uh, the telangiostat plus erolimus. So, um, obviously this is a small phase two trial, as I mentioned. So, uh, the median PFS was encouraging in, in that it was 3.8 months with the combination, uh, with the telangiostat versus 1.9 months for the uh, placebo plus erolimus. Responses, however, were low. Uh, and uh, zero responders uh, in the Everolimus placebo arm versus one responder out of 46, 2.2. But the uh, regimen was very well tolerated, and that was encouraging to uh, uh, design the next trial, which is a registration trial that actually received uh, the uh, breakthroughs designation and accelerated approval. And so we await the results, uh, hopefully, by the end of this year. This is the Cantata uh, trial design. This is a uh, 444 uh, patient phase three trial. And it's in the salvage setting again, up to two lines prior of therapy, stratification by PDL1 uh, exposure uh, and uh, IMDC risk. The primary endpoint is PFS by investigator initiated, so by blinded, uh, in, uh, uh, not investigator, by blinded independent radiology review, the two arms of study, uh, the uh, agent telagnostat, 800 milligram twice daily plus cabo at full dose, 60 milligram per day versus placebo plus cabozantinib. So as I mentioned, uh, the, the results uh, hopefully will be available by the end of the year. Uh, and if this is a positive uh, study, hopefully this will be a novel agent that uh, will uh, make it to the clinic for our patients. So the next, uh, exciting agent is the HIF2 alpha inhibitor, uh, uh, MK6482. Uh, and uh, I think it's important here to review quickly uh, that patients with sporadic clear cell RCC uh, uh, have a defective VHL uh, uh, protein that leads to constitutive accumulation of HIF and, and the important HIF here that uh, uh, does the damage in RCC is the HIF2 alpha. And this agent is a small potent molecule that blocks uh, uh, the HIF2 alpha. And it took years of, uh, 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 you know, understanding the biology of clear cell RCC, the work of uh, Dr. Bill Kalin, who received 
the Nobel Prize uh, last year with his colleagues uh, on uh, understanding uh, hypoxia and HIF. And this is uh, the fruit of this uh, decades of research that brought us this uh, exciting small molecule HIF2 alpha inhibitor to block uh, HIF2 alpha. And the uh, study that I'm going to uh, review here quickly in one slide was presented at ASCO uh, GU uh, last February by Dr. Schwery. Here is the uh, summary of the uh, efficacy endpoints. So first of all, this agent is tolerable. Uh, there were few adverse events, anemia, because it blocks EPO, and a few patients, 4%, I believe, had hypoxia, again, because uh, uh, of the mechanism of action. Uh, but the impressive thing is in this box here, that this is a waterfall plot showing a tumor regression. These are heavily pretreated patients, and uh, you see that the response rate in this heavily pretreated uh, patients, there were 55 patients enrolled on the study, 24% objective response rate, and a PFS median of 11 months. There were responses in all IMDC risk categories, favorable, intermediate, and poor risk. Because of its well uh, favorable safety profile and the encouraging results uh, in this heavily pretreated uh, phase two trial, uh, there is now a uh, large phase three trial, registration trial, with this agent versus Everolimus. This is a 700 36 patient phase three trial, randomizing MK6482 at the dose uh, uh, 120 milligram orally daily versus Everolimus at the standard dose and schedule. In these patients, uh, this is, uh, the stratification is by AMDC, a number of prior uh, VEGF uh, agents, one versus two or more. Here are the key eligible criteria, similar to what we've seen before, but basically up to a maximum of three prior, three prior lines of therapy. The endpoints, the two co-primary endpoints are PFS and OS, and I think the trial has launched, ha has been accruing. This is a global study. I think if it's positive, I think it will be welcome news uh, for our patients with RCC uh, because it brings them uh, also a, a new uh, class of agents that could be potentially combined with immune checkpoint inhibitors or mTOR inhibitors, uh, or even TKIs, to uh, actually uh, increase the uh, potential of responses. Back to you, Tony. Oh, thank you, Dr. Tanier. So let's check in with our viewers. I, I see a few more uh, questions. Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Uh, uh, McDermott here, uh, would you put, are you using nivolumab and ipilimumab in favor risk patient? And do you see a situation where you can do that? Uh, yes, uh, we do that. Um, we obviously have a long discussion with patients before we do that. Right now, the NCCN guidelines don't give it its strongest recommendation, but there are patients who are very motivated uh, to achieve not just long-term overall survival, but gain a chance at uh, treatment-free intervals and treatment-free survival. And we think Ipinevo offers the best chance of that. So if the patient is uh, relatively young and motivated, understands the risks of the side effects, um, and is willing to accept those trade-offs, we move forward with Ipinevo and good risk patients. Thank you, thank you. And a question for you since you've been involved you know, with your leadership uh, at, uh, in biomarkers in renal cell cancer. Uh, today, we do not have one uh, approved to help us in metastatic or even early stage RCC. But what do you think uh, we should do? Well, I think we're doing better, but you know, it's not gonna be easy. Single agent biomarkers are hard, particularly in a disease as heterogeneous, as you know, as kidney cancer combination biomarkers are going to even be more difficult, but we are making some progress with, for example, RNA sequencing. As you know, there seem to be gene signatures that are associated with response to both VEGF blockade and uh, immune therapies, and so we should be including those looks in our prospective trials because there may be ways, for example, to select patients who are considering pure IO approaches or certainly second-line uh, pure VEGF and we're all working together as a community, all of us, which really is very refreshing for patients. That's what patients want us. So in summary for this program, I hope uh, first you enjoyed it. I hope uh, 
now you are familiar more, especially with the latest update up to just um, last week, ESMO 2020. You're familiar with new approaches in uh, first line and putting it in context with the focus of uh, on VEGF IO and IO IO. Of course, that creates a, a you know a conundrum with second line with post IO uh, treatment. And uh, hopefully, overall, uh, you've seen also uh, some of the potential um, you know art of medicine that we have to. Um, really practice with all these side effects, especially the immune related uh, adverse event. Uh, so please remember to uh, complete and submit your question and your evaluation for the CME mock uh, credit and to visit us at preview.com live RCC 2020 to download the slides and don't forget Twitter, please. Thank you very much for your attention.